Okay. Good morning. Welcome to our forum on how natural resources can help us combat climate change. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Tai, and I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. NYLCV Education Fund's mission is to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. We're happy to be joined by our event partners, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. We also want to thank our series sponsor, Con Edison. This forum is the fourth in our series on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCPA. We held forums last year focusing on offshore wind transmission, buildings and efficiency, and transportation. We will hold more in the future to talk about manufacturing and waste. The breadth of the CLCPA is economy-wide. It legally commits New York to achieve emissions reductions of 85% across all sectors by 2050 with the goal of carbon neutrality. We heard yesterday how Governor Cuomo was planning to address the energy sector, but we need to do a lot more to achieve our goals. Through this series, our goal is to dive deeper into how we're going to achieve those ambitious climate goals in a way that is effective, efficient, and equitable. We also wanna build public awareness, educate New Yorkers on climate policy, and develop recommendations for how to meet those objectives. The state is off to a great start with the bold clean energy goals of 70% renewable energy by 2030 and 100% clean energy by 2040. As Governor Cuomo announced yesterday, we're taking concrete steps to get there, announcing another 24 renewable energy projects, including 2,500 megawatts of offshore wind. New York also has some clean transportation policies in place and NYLCV and other advocates are working hard to advance others this year. But today we're here to talk about how protecting nature helps with climate mitigation and adaptation, including how farms can help fight climate change. Our state has a long history of protecting natural lands, going back to the visionary establishment of the Adirondack and Catskill State Parks. Our open spaces are some of our most vital environmental assets. We'll hear more about how natural areas and farms can be part of the solution to the climate crisis. Agriculture and forestry are not only significant economic drivers for our state, they're also integral to carbon sequestration. Our farms provide open space and connect New Yorkers to healthy food options so they don't rely on groceries brought in from across the country or another part of the planet. We'll also hear important how, tree, how important trees are, both in our rural communities and urban areas. Trees are in carbon sink and they help combat the urban heat island effect, the deadliest impact of rising temperatures from climate change. To guide our discussion, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this morning's panel. Shahid Naeem, who's Professor of Ecology and Director of the Earth Institute Center at Columbia University. He obtained his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and previously served on the faculty of the University of Minnesota and the University of Washington. His teaching, research, and publications focus on the importance of diversity and of biodiversity in the functioning of ecosystems and the services they pride in humanity. Welcome to Shahid. Well, thank you, um, uh, Julian. Thanks to the organizers uh, for putting this together. Um, <clears throat> I think it's going to be uh, both uh, uh, interesting and, and a lot of fun um, to consider these relatively complex issues. Um, as a professor, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I have a tendency to start with a global picture and then focus down to the local. So let me start um, um, with that. And um, um, I think the best way to start is with this first slide. Um, if I can have the next slide. And oh, so it's not going to show it all. So there we go. So um, this is a picture of photosynthesis across the planet. And so New York is over there. And um, what's neat about this is you can really see how heterogeneous it is. There's not much going on in the Saharan deserts. Um, there's a lot going on in the ocean, but it's mostly around the coasts, right? And then um, there's also a lot more going on in the north than there is in the south because there's more land in the north, so there's more surface for photosynthesis and terrestrial ecosystems. And what's, what's neat about uh, starting with that perspective is in the next slide, I'm sure many of you have seen this graph, is a picture which is sort of aesthetically quite uh, uh, pleasing, but it shows three things in one diagram. One is that in the wintertime, there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is what these peaks are that you see in the sort of roller coaster path of carbon dioxide over the years. And then um, in the summertime, when the vegetation kicks in and photosynthesis starts, that carbon dioxide is drawn down. And as you can see, the north is where a lot of this is happening. The south, a lot less. Of course, the tropical rainforests are down there, but there's just a lot less land than there is up in the north. 
And this is all being done primarily by vegetation. However, you can see as you look over time that the height of the peaks is going up and up and up. And that is coming from our industrial inputs. And so that is the climate change, the, one of the key causes of climate change. The next slide is one of many slides that comes from the uh, Global uh, Carbon Project, which is a great site if you haven't visited. They prepare lots of graphics and info, information for, for the public. Um, it's a really uh, a, 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 a great place to go for the latest data and, and a trustworthy source. And what's interesting about that is if you look at what sequesters or what draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and what puts it in, the big arrow there on the left, that's from fossil fuels and it's huge, right? And then you try to look at, well, what's gonna pull it back down out of the atmosphere? And you'll see that the biosphere is a fairly large green arrow, and then the ocean is a fairly large green arrow as well. So in a way, the number of major players in this is quite limited. We have fossil fuels which contribute, and then we have the biosphere which brings the carbon dioxide back down out of the atmosphere and puts it into things like the permafrost and the tundra and into soil and then to sediments in the ocean. The ocean stores a lot of carbon, but actually doesn't draw down as much as terrestrial systems does on an annual basis. So here we are looking at, um, in this particular forum, the role of nature, if you will, in particular, the role of forests. So in the next slide, um, you might ask yourself, given that the biosphere is a relatively small arrow, um, why is it that we might actually focus on it um, uh, at all? And this slide, I think, tells you um, why. Even though uh, the biosphere doesn't contribute as much as we would like, if you think about the sources, the big source, as you saw in the previous diagram, is the use of fossil fuels, industrial activities. And the other uh, source, which is a little smaller, but also occurs um, in a major way um, through, uh, through land use change, things like deforestation, agriculture, anything that'll disturb the stored carbon and send it up into the atmosphere, right? Um, but then if you look at the sinks, there are three major sinks. There's the ocean, there's the atmosphere, and then there's the biosphere. And here we have a picture of a forest with all those trees in there. The thing about the atmosphere is storing carbon dioxide there is not a good thing because that's what's leading to climate change. That's just leading to global warming because the carbon dioxide absorbs the infrared and then and warms up the atmosphere. And the ocean is not a great place to store it either because that leads to ocean acidification and leads to a whole knock-on sort of chain of environmental um, uh, impacts. But Agriculture, forestry, um, natural systems like grasslands, the, 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 um, the boreal forest, the tundra, and so forth, tropical rainforest, these are a great place to store carbon because when they bring carbon down, they actually put it into uh, biomass. In particular in forest, that would be wood, but also into the soil and in other places where that carbon can be sunk. And wood has a lot of uses, um, not just for, for biofuels, but also for conditioning the soil, conditioning the atmosphere. And also, um, uh, if, you, if you turn it into uh, furniture, then it's a, a more permanent uh, storage of that carbon. Um, then say if you turn it into wood chips, which is also important for biofuels, but then that tends to return the carbon back to the atmosphere. So on the next slide, um, uh, today we're gonna, uh, as I said, you know, focus locally the, the mantra of, of conservation or of environmental biology, which is my area of expertise, is to think globally and act locally because this is where change happens, right? And the, the, the um, uh, diagram all the way on the left is um, uh, one of these uh, uh, projections from uh, the Manhattan Project, which shows what New York might have looked like a long time ago when there were just Native Americans wandering around. There's been a lot of change, but New York State still has a lot of forests. In part, that's because a lot of agriculture has been abandoned. And although we've lost a lot of forests over, the, um, uh, over history, it's been coming back. Um, forest regrowth is the usual term for it. And so in a way, it presents lots of opportunities for how we manage that. In the next slide, I'm gonna summarize it, you know, that what, what, what's involved today is what I call managing nature. You can divide that into different types of managing nature. One is, is very important, that's the social dimension, the social factor, because you have to engage people, they have to buy into the process, they have to understand the process. And, um, um, and we have Sam Bishop from Trees New York, who will, uh, is given the onerous task of having to cover that enormous field. Um, and then management actually consists of what I consider sort of two, but there's, they overlap quite a bit, um, different um, um, uh, drivers. One is conservation and the other is use-driven management. 
Um, Jessica Avni Mahar is going to, uh, rep from the Nature Conservancy, will talk about conservation and protection and preservation. And then use driven management. We have John Bartow, Bartow from uh, the Empire State Forest Products Association. He'll talk about management, which involves using our forests um, in a sustainable and, and, and in a wise way. So um, I'm going to um, introduce our um, uh, next, um, uh, our first speaker in the, in the panel, as I said, it's, it's uh, Sam Bishop. And then Sam Bishop um, is a, um, or Samuel Bishop the, the, the second. He's an education director and an arborist for Trees New York, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And he's worked there for a long time. He's been there for 15 years. I've been at Columbia for 18, so I haven't beat. Um, um, uh, he is an International Society of, Ar of uh, uh, Arboriculture uh, board certified master arborist. I wish I was such a person and um, a municipal specialist. He also teaches pruning at New York Botanical Garden and has taught urban forestry at the new school. So I'll turn it over to, um, uh, to Sam and thanks so much for uh, finding the time to contribute to this panel. Thank you, Sahid, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And we'll be talking a little bit about urban heat islands and then uh, at the end, just a little bit about environmental justice too. So if I could have the next slide, please. So just as a bit of background about Trees New York for anyone who doesn't know, Trees New York is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we were founded in 1976 as a volunteer response to cutbacks in tree, in tree care and tree planting budgets uh, by the city. And it was a group of different individuals as well as organizations who were concerned about urban trees who effectively worked with the parks department to say if the city's not able to provide this care, can they step in and do some of that? And our focus is primarily on younger street trees because that is typically when our trees are most vulnerable. So getting those trees through their first couple of years in the ground established and growing and growing well. Our core program is the Citizen Pruner course. It's a 12-hour course, and at the end of it, you're jointly licensed by Trees New York City and the Parks Department if you pass uh, the exam to care for and prune New York City street trees. So could I have the next slide, please? So talking today, uh, what is an urban heat island? which is one of our major uh, climate change and both climate and land use change related uh, challenges in New York City. And an urban heat island is an urban area where temperatures are higher than surrounding areas due to human activities. And this is not a new phenomenon. They were first noted as far back as 1820 by, Luke, by a gentleman named Luke Howard in London, who realized that temperatures on any given day in London were higher than temperatures in the surrounding area. So what causes an urban heat island? It's caused primarily by land use changes. So when we create surfaces that absorb the sunlight that shines on them very strongly, so think pavement, asphalt, concrete, brick, and then there's a few other surprise substances that you may not particularly be aware of. Uh, surprisingly, artificial turf playing fields have an incredible ability to absorb uh, heat from the sun. And it's actually become somewhat of a player safety problem on some fields, where especially if teams are practicing in the summer, the air temperature on the field can be 120 plus, even if it's not that hot around it. So on this map of New York City, you can see typically the brighter areas are areas that have, uh, or excuse me, the darker areas, the darker red areas are areas that have uh, higher land surface temperatures, so hence typically fewer trees. If you look in particular at Manhattan, you can see there's that little strip of light blue in the middle, that of course is Central Park, and then that large dark blue dot right in the middle of that is the reservoir. Next slide, please. So comparing urban heat islands and urban vegetation, how do these things work together? Well, the most obvious one is that trees can shade these surfaces so that they don't receive that direct sunlight and heat up. So these are two different images of New York City uh, on the same day taken at 1030 AM. So a lot of the day's heating from solar radiation from the sun hasn't even really happened that much yet. 
On the left, you can see the temperature, and on the right, you can see vegetation levels. So you can see there's a pretty strong correlation between the two. You can see clear areas where uh, some of our parks are that are much cooler, as well as, in some cases, somewhat cooler areas. Think of the typically more heavily treed or planted uh, as a whole Staten Island when looking at um, when looking at that comparison. Next slide, please. So in terms of how trees actually help reduce that urban heat island effect, uh, shading, as we said, is the major benefit. And as the tree gets larger, of course, we get more shade. So that's why New York City in particular is now working to plant as large a tree as possible in every tree bed that they have available to get as much shade for the environmental benefits. The next slide, please. The other major method, and this is not just trees, this is all green plants, is evapotranspiration. And that is the evaporation of water from plants, which they use for different physiological processes, but mostly to cool themselves. To evaporate that water, you need, you need heat. And to do that, the plants will draw that heat from the surrounding environment. So trees, grass, and to a certain degree, bare soil all contribute to that evapotranspiration, which, tributes, which contributes to their cooling effect and their urban heat island fighting properties. The next slide. So this does tie into environmental justice. And environmental justice is typically defined as a fair distribution of environmental goods and bads, relying on fair and inclusive outcomes to achieve that outcome resulting in places where vulnerable people should feel welcome and safe. And environmental justice has been a traditional challenge in many places, and it somewhat in the past has not been as strongly focused on as, it, as we should. Uh, in many cities around the world, one of the ways that environmental justice functions is typically uh, lower income neighborhoods have fewer trees and less canopy cover than higher income neighborhoods. Um, exactly how that gets measured is somewhat debated, but it's definitely there. There is a contrasting problem of environmental gentrification, which is where environmental improvements and amenities, potentially including creating parks and tree planting, result in the displacement of pre-existing communities. Effectively, the neighborhood becomes nicer, property values go up, and existing residents are priced out. The other problem is that the solutions to some of these things can create new burdens, such as, for example, property owners now having to clean up leaves post tree planting, which can represent a substantial expense or burden for some property owners. And the next slide, please. This is tree planting, a tree planting map from the Parks Department in New York City. This is current. I downloaded just the other day. And New York City works very hard to distribute the trees that it's planting fairly and evenly throughout the five boroughs. The green dots are recently planted and the orange dots are pending trees to be planted. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Sam. Kind of so we're gonna uh, hold questions to the end and we'll um, move to the next uh, uh, <clears throat> speaker in our, in our panel. And that's uh, Jessica uh, Otney Mahar. And, and <clears throat> she is the New York Policy and Strategy Director for the Nature Conservancy since joining the Conservancy in 2007, Jessica and her team have advocated for the enactment of dozens of laws and regulations and billions in funding to protect and restore New York's natural resources and tackle climate change. In addition to leading the Conservancy's policy team in New York, she co-leads the organization's statewide conservation team. So thanks, Jessica, for participating in this. Thank you, Professor. And if you can move to the next slide. So I wanted to also start by saying thank you to my colleague, Michelle Brown, who is an appointee on the Climate Action Council Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel, along, along with John and others. Um, some of these slides are hers and she's a PhD scientist, but I wanted to use them. Um, so don't question me too hard or I'll turn it back over to the professor. Um, I wanted to use them to talk a little bit about New York's forests statewide. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions from a policy perspective that that committee, that, that advisory group is looking at, as well as the Nature Conservancy and other organizations. Um, and then um, talk a little bit about the public funding sources that are available to do all of this work. So as you can see in this map, New York's forests 
um, are everywhere. We have tons of forests in New York State. And as John knows very well, a lot of our forests are actually privately owned. And that's a really important fact to understand. I think everyone thinks about the Catskills and the Adirondacks and the forest preserves. Um, but even within those blue lines, and then of course throughout the state, there are tremendous amounts of forests being owned and stewarded and cared for um, by private, um, private individuals um, or private companies. And that's a really important fact to remember when we start to talk about the solutions that we need to make sure that our forests can stay for us and we can use our forests as a tool in helping us combat climate change. Next slide. So we have big goals in New York State. Um, so the state has set goals for carbon sequestration. Um, and as you can see, there's two dates here, 2030 and 2050. You'll hear those dates a lot in various parts of the state's climate law. Um, right now, the state's forests, um, just their forests, annually sequester or hold about 26 million metric tons of net annual carbon dioxide. Um, the goal for 2030 is to bump that up to 30. That's still a big, you know, that's an increase that we need to make sure um, we get to. And, you know, maintaining our forest cover is a big job. But as you'll see in that second goal, sequestering 60 million metric tons is a big move in just 20 years, doubling. Um, obviously, they're looking, as you can see in that goal, at all land types. And you'll be hearing on another panel today about the agricultural sector. Um, but New York's forests are going to be a big part of achieving that goal, as the professor pointed out, how important our forests are um, as part of the biosphere and storing that carbon. Next slide. So New York is part of something called the U.S. Climate Alliance. Um, when the President Trump's administration removed um, the U.S. from the Paris Climate Accords, a number of states, a growing number of states, now representing most of or majority of um, the U.S. population, created a climate alliance to meet those goals. Um, and within the U.S. Climate Alliance, there's this thing called the Natural and Working Lands Challenge. And New York has accepted the challenge, which is really exciting, which means we're going to be taking a look and we're doing this through the Climate Action Council to see how much our natural and working lands can do as a solution and then setting those goals that I just showed. So we've accepted this challenge and that's really launched us along with the state's climate law into doing this work and achieving those goals. Next slide. So there's a couple of strategies you can use to protect forests in New York State. Um, right now, um, we need to make sure that we're maintaining our forests, keeping our forests for us. What we, we, the term used for that is avoiding conversion. Um, so we're kind of stable right now. There's some areas of the state that are, you know, dipping below um, and seeing conversion that's outpacing regrowth. Um, and then um, there's areas of the state that are doing better. So we need to make sure that we have um, good data to understand that. Next slide. Um, so research is really important in making sure that we have a good understanding of what's actually happening in the forest. And as John knows, this is an incredibly um, now high tech um, process of surveying our forest and understanding what's going on there. Um, and what's um, preventing our forests from regrowing um, in places that, you know, they're not being fully converted. Next slide. So, um, you know, obviously we were talking, the professor was talking earlier about things you can do um, like sequestering carbon in um, harvested wood products. I'm sure John's going to talk about that. So I'm not um, making sure that we're using foresters um, so that private landowners are getting professional help and thinking about how to manage their forests so that they're using their forests and, 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 and um, stewarding their forests in a way that keeps that carbon on the land and in the trees. Um, and um, next slide. So there's threats happening all around our state. And here um, you can see the red um, and orange areas in particular, and even the light green and yellow areas are places where um, regeneration status is threatened. What that means is the ability of the trees to grow back. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. Big ones um, are deer. We have deer eating up the understory of our forests. Um, and also invasive species are another threat. Obviously development and conversion is a threat as well. Next slide. So um, as we're talking with the Climate Action Council advisory panel, we're talking about 
how we can create solutions that meet the needs of a wide range of forest landowners. Next slide. And those are things, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, we can talk about them later, and I'm sure this is being recorded, um, but all the things we can do in different types of forests to not only protect them from conversion, but also make sure that they're being managed in a way that they're regenerating, that they're resilient to climate change, um, and also um, that those owners can continue to um, keep them as forests. Next slide. So this last piece, we are working very hard in connection with New York League of Conservation Voters and many partners to protect environmental funding in New York State because there's so much environmental funding um, that protects our forests and helps us meet these climate change goals. Um, we want to make sure, uh, obviously, in a very difficult budget year, these funds are protected. And then there was a bond act um, that was proposed uh, and was supposed to be on the November 2020 ballot. Obviously, the pandemic and the economic crisis put that on hold. So we are working to have that put back on a future ballot, which would be really exciting and create a huge boost for both this kind of program, um, protecting natural climate solutions, and many other strategies to address climate change. And then there are also federal programs, local funding, um, and um, state tax policy that can help landowners keep their forests as forests. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I wanna thank uh, the League's Education Fund and the Sabin Center for inviting me to present here today. Um, Sorry, I was waiting for uh, Jessica. <laughs> I thought maybe she might have a, a uh, wrap-up comment. But oh, let me uh, introduce you so you don't have to. Uh, uh, okay. That. But um, um, I'm so uh, John Bartow was appointed ex executive director of the Empire State Forest Products Association in July 18th of 2015. The Empire State Forest Product Association is a nonprofit organization for businesses and individuals whose mission is to improve public awareness and promote public policy in support of productive and healthy New York forests and the forest products economy to meet the needs of society today and for future generations. Sorry for the little hiccup there, but thanks, John. Thank you. So if we could go to the next slide, I'll jump right into this. And I apologize, there'll be some redundancy between Jessica's slides and mine. I'll try to skip through that. But we'd like to view the economic, social, and ecological values of New York's forests as inextricably linked, much like our timber supply and production network. When one could value or advocate for any single one of these values, we believe that to have healthy, productive, and sustainable forests, you need all three legs of the proverbial stool. Our forests need all three values in order to survive and contribute fully to climate change. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm going to give a few highlights of the forest that you've already heard a little bit. But New York's forests are extensive, with just under 19 million acres of forest cover found in every region of the state nearly 16 million classified as timberlands capable of supporting merchantable timber. Next slide, please. Despite only modest statewide population growth and population losses in upstate, the forest in New York is still extensive and relatively stable. Next slide, please. And as Jessica noted, New York's forests are largely privately owned. If you look at the bottom bar, uh, the availability and quantity of New York's forests rests largely upon hundreds of thousands of forest landowners who own 75% of the state's total forest land. Too often, when we think of forest ownership, we focus on the 21% owned by the state, mostly in the Adirondacks. If you ask most New Yorkers where the forests are, we'd be lucky if they said the Adirondacks, happy if they said the Catskills, and shocked if they realized that over 50% of New York's forests are owned by 200,000 families who own 10 or more acres of land. <clears throat> Corporate ownership accounts for about 14% of New York's private forests, yet represents the largest portion of managed lands, with much of it under third party certification for sustainability. What we need to find is that slice of family, public, and corporate ownership that will manage for sequestration and resiliency to maximize our climate benefits. Next slide, please. New York's forest based economy is significant $23 billion total statewide economic impact, nearly 100,000 jobs with an average wage over $61,000, and that's a family supporting wage in New York, over $300 million in annual payments to private landowners. That's the equivalent of an annual environmental protection fund budget, which only provides a few million to forest stewardship. And on forest carbon, next slide, please. New York's forests sequester, New York's forests are a carbon sink, meaning they sequester CO2 
in the atmosphere and store it in above ground biomass, below ground biomass and in the soil. In New York forests, provide the only existing large scale mechanism for removing CO2 from the atmosphere, 25 to 26 million tons annually. That's known as the flux as opposed to the sink, uh, which is really the annual rate by which we need to hit our targets on. Manipulating the above ground biomass through trees is primarily that forest management does. Products manufactured, oh, next slide. Yeah. Products manufactured from harvested wood benefit carbon in two ways. First, durable wood products used in construction and building materials, furniture and flooring store carbon for long periods of time. Secondly, wood products can also can be a substitution for materials and energy that otherwise may be produced from more carbon intensive materials such as concrete, steel, or from fossil fuel intensive heat processes. Next slide, please. This, is a, this slide points to a very important point going on. First, New York's forest growth to drain or growth to harvest and mortality ratio is greater than 2.1. That is in any given year, our forest growth twice as much as it removed via mortality or disease, fire, insects, or harvested wood products, a net gain of growth that is significant. Second, per unit of forest land area, the red solid line here, New York's forests are sequestering more carbon year after year, and the trajectory is that they will continue to do so. Third, on the other hand, the annual sequestration rate of New York's forests is on decline. Today, our forests annually sequester about 25 million metric tons of carbon and are projected to decline to 22.5 million metric tons by 2030. That is the wrong trajectory. Diminishing rates are mostly attributable to conversion of forests to other land uses. In other words, conversion to something more profitable for the landowner. Next slide, please. The CLCPA presents us a tremendous opportunity for New York's forest sector. New York's forests currently sequester that 25 to 26 million metric tons of carbon. To help achieve the net carbon zero in 2050, we need our forests and wood products to contribute to the doubling of the amount of carbon that is sequestered per year across the states. Increased effectiveness in New York's forest sector to sequester car and store carbon that are being considered by the Climate Advisory Council and specifically the Ag and Forestry Panel are the following. Avoided conversion, improved forest management practices, afforestation or reforestation, harvested wood products, and a robust bioeconomy. Next slide, please. Globally, as well as in New York, there is an increasing demand for harvested wood products from paper packaging to furniture grade lumber to biomass for energy. Demand is growing and by any reasonable projection, it will keep growing for decades. While it may seem counterintuitive, markets for forest products and forest biomass encourage and lead private landowners to, number one, increase the amount of forest land in New York, primarily by converting marginal agricultural lands to forests. Number two, invest in management practices that increase the productivity of their forests, which increases forest ability to sequester additional carbon. This is why our forests have sequestered more carbon than they have emitted for nearly 65 years while supplying the forest products and energy that has fueled economic expansion. Three, reducing the carbon impacts associated with harvesting by increasing sequestration. Four, increase the carbon stored in harvested wood products. And finally, substitution benefits of wood products. Next slide, please. While take, talking about the forest products industry, one has to understand the unique nature of the modern forest and how the forest economy exists in most regions, including New York. I often use the descriptor of the integrated forest economy value change. Most forest economy are one, highly integrated, two, consist of numerous different manufacturing subsectors. One sector's byproducts tend to be another subsector's primary product. And finally, each manufacturing unit is fairly dependent on the sales and byproducts of its overall revenue stream. In this picture, you can see the kind of disbursement of that supply chain, uh, starting with uh, the, the working forest in the center, and then the various products and integrated nature of it all. Next slide, please. In conclusion, what I really hope you can come away with from this slide and the presentation is the recognition of what markets do to help keep our forest as forest and sequester carbon long-term. So we need to recognize the role of markets in landowner decision-making and keeping their forests as forests and making improvements to their forest to sequester carbon. Recognizing the overall carbon sequestration and substitution benefits of wood products. 
recognize sustainable forest management as a means to achieve additionality in carbon sequestration, as well as a host of other ecosystem benefits. And finally, to recognize the socioeconomic benefits of forest-based communities. Thank you, and I guess we'll be going to some questions now. Thank you, John. Boy, I have to say, I, I want to quit being a professor and go and learn how to prune trees, <laughs> and join the policy <laughs> arena and make significant change and learn more about the complex landscape of uh, private and, and, and publicly uh, owned and managed lands, uh, rather than uh, lecturing to students about introductory biology <laughs> and conservation. But, but um, I'm stuck with my, my job. And um, I thought I'd start out um, um, with a question to, to all of you, and then we'll take questions from, from the audience. Um, and what I was thinking about when looking at your presentations and about my field in general is that, you know, um, climate change is part of global change. And global change consists of many factors, but the big five are, you know, climate change, but then biodiversity loss, which is my area of specialty, invasive species like the longhorn beetle, the emerald ash borer, the gypsy moth, and so forth. Um, emerging diseases like oak wilt, um, nitrogen pollution, which can fertilize the forest, but also favors invasive species. And I was wondering, um, you know, we're often criticized for studying these things independently, climate change, biodiversity, loss of invasive species, when in fact, they interact with one another. And I was wondering if these other factors really um, impact the work that, that each of you are, are, are trying to do. Um, um, and, you know, for me, for example, I would imagine that uh, invasive species and diseases like oak wilt really change the uh, landscape for uh, uh, wood products and, and, and managing uh, uh, wood resources. And biodiversity loss is, a, is an interesting problem in the, in the forest around here because we've lost the chestnut, we've lost the elm, but what happens if we lose the oaks to oak wilt? Um, is that something that is talked about in the education arena, is considered in the policy arena, and in the in and in the um, in dealing with private landowners and the use. Any any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on it. You're absolutely correct. It's a huge impact that's going on. If we look back at the chestnut blight disease, I mean, chestnut was a, a very valuable and well used product that uh, was a huge mix of our uh, forest product sector uh, 50, 60, even 100 years ago, but doesn't exist really today. There's some work doing on bringing uh, um, chestnut back, uh, but that's still a long ways out. But right now we're currently faced with a huge ash crisis because of emerald ash borer. And that's been a huge impact on some of our valued harvested wood products. Ash is an extremely valuable tree. Uh, it's used most notably in construction of baseball bats, um, which has created a shift in that dynamic that they have to do. And the oak wilt uh, really has got people kind of very nervous. Um, what, what could happen with it? Uh, to New York's credit, it's done a very good early detection and rapid response uh, in dealing with oak wilt. But we already see it in markets. We already see it in the ability to move those wood products. You know, if you're going to ship oak logs uh, across the state or even out of state, uh, there's challenges that are based uh, in affecting the market there as well let alone the biodiversity of the forest, which I'll let Jessica or somebody else respond. Yeah, and I know this is a big issue um, for Sam with urban forests too, so I, I won't comment on that, but certainly um, our forests are facing um, a bunch of different impacts and um, the impacts kind of, they exacerbate each other, as you were saying, Professor. So um, in our forests across the state, as John said, we're seeing invasive species um, and, um, we're also, our forests are having to adapt to climate change. So the composition of our forests is changing um, and it's harder for forests to do that changing and make those adaptations when they're not healthy and when they're under stress from these other, these other issues. So certainly um, invasive species um, are a no, kind of a new level of threat for New York state now because of climate change and because of um, how important we've come to realize our forests are as a tool in combating climate change. Um, and that certainly exists for other ecosystem types as well. Yep. For our urban forests are not as separated as, as many people would probably think from our upstate forests. All of these problems get passed back and forth between them, um, in part primarily due to people moving things. We've had all those invasive species problems here. Uh, trees in New York worked with the Parks Department when there was a potential outbreak of oak wilt. Happily, it was just one tree in New York City, and it turned out uh, 
not to be a, a real problem. Um, but we deal with all these issues. We deal with them together. We train our volunteers on recognition of invasive pests and other and diseases and other problems. So it affects our urban trees just as much as it affects our woodland trees, even though I know in a lot of cases it might not seem like it. It's like, oh, that's an upstate thing. Nope, it happens here too. Oh, Thank, you're muted. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for, you know, I've been doing this since March, but I still get, I still forget that mute button. Um, the, um, Thanks for, for, for considering that question because it seems that um, so much is, is going on in terms of using forests as a tool for climate um, uh, mitigation and for adaptation to climate change. But you know, it gets so much more difficult when you have to deal with uh, disease invasive species and, 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 and so forth. So thanks for addressing that. Um, some questions from the, from the um, um, uh, audience. Um, if I can, let's see, here we go. So the first question is, um, and I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, um, what do you see as the most important steps local governments can take to support forest conservation and stewardship, recognizing the role of home rule in New York's governance and land use? Anyone would like to, to take that? I could start. And again, I think you guys probably have really important points to make too. Um, you know, I think as this question points out, there is so much that goes on um, in planning boards and town halls. Um, every week across New York State that, you know, really the fate of our forests lie in those hands as well. It's not just a state policy discussion. Um, so there's a lot that local governments can do from doing things like inventories to understand what natural resources exist in their communities to really thinking about conservation of natural resources, um, both in their codes and also comprehensive plan process. Um, and then also a lot of local governments around the state have been really taking action from making sure they're doing things to cluster development and conservation development, tree ordinances to protect trees during development, and then also creating local funding sources so that they can acquire um, conservation easements or fee ownership of lands within their community. And that can help protect both forests, but also different kinds of ecosystems and also local farms. Um, a number of communities across the state, including New Paltz this November, um, have passed ballot measures to um, raise revenue so that they have local money to protect resources that are precious to their own communities. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that. I mean, it's, it's local governments have a tremendous role to play here going forward. And one of the things that we've worked for years on is the right to practice forestry. So as they take into consideration what those private landowners are, what they desire to do with the uh, land as they go forward and, and continue to have those lands working and contributing both to uh, harvested wood products, but also to ensuring that forest is healthy and, and age diversified. Um, so as local governments look to do it, I think it's a very good point Jessica makes about having good inventories, what's on your forest and, and your agricultural lands, and how do you ensure that you don't put at risk some of those drivers that help keep that forest as forest going forward while you're also looking to preserve and conserve it. Yep. I would add to that that there's also a large role for the government for public education and outreach, especially um, there may be cases where people wind up inheriting property from deceased family members that is forest and without a strong understanding of the resources that are already existent and resources to help them manage it and someone to just kind of hold their hand and guide them through the process. It can be very intimidating or confusing to deal with it and in which case they may simply decide to sell it quickly, take the money and move on. Well, thanks everyone. Um, um, <clears throat> I'll um, go to the, the second question now. And this reminds me, I, one of my graduate students worked on bioswales. And so she had to get there early in the morning to get the pre-dawn water potential and so forth. And a person came out from her house and was complaining about the tree in the center of the bioswale because she said it blocks her solar panel. So, so and my student of course didn't know how to respond to this. Um, but, but let me um, uh, link that to the second question. What is the interaction between utility scale solar projects and the need to preserve forests and open spaces. If anyone would like to take that on. Um, 
it's a um, it's an issue that we're definitely discussing quite a bit. You know, we talk about conversion of lands, be them agricultural or forest, um, which represent 85% of the state's landscape. Uh, it's it's you know, it's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, we're trying to deploy and, and upscale a, a significant amount of solar uh, panels and industrial scale solar panels. Uh, it's also a financial uh, attraction to a lot of landowners. There's a lot of money being put into lease payments and whatnot that can happen with solar farms. So economically, a landowner would sit there and say, well, what will my forest or my farm yield mean? It's significantly less in many cases than what they can get from a solar lease or something that they're entering into. So there's lots of forces at play here, but if one of our goals is to avoid conversion of forest and farmland, uh, we're going to have to wrestle with that question. And uh, I think rather than just being saying, no, we don't want to do it, I think we've got to start uh, being part of identifying where is it we can deploy uh, these renewable resources because we're going to need them. And how do we do it? How do we do it in a way that's fair to landowners? How do we do it in a way that's fair to ratepayers? How do we do it in a way that helps us achieve those goals? So uh, I, in our sector, and we just had a meeting on this yesterday on the avoiding convergence convergence uh, sub panel, really having to say we want to be part of the solution to citing these things as opposed to just saying don't do it on our farms and for us. So. And just to add to that, one of the big pieces of work the Nature Conservancy is doing with partners um, is working to really map and identify these areas across the state where um, things could be cited in a low impact way. So prioritizing citing of large scale energy and transmission and storage um, in ways that um, maybe doesn't make unnecessary choices between um, forests and other ecosystem resources, you know, services that we need to provide communities and renewable energy development. Um, obviously that would be the first choice spot. Um, and then as John said, um, we will have to grapple with this. And recently the new Office of Renewable Energy Siting put out um, new siting regulations and they were really focused on trying to mitigate impacts. And um, we and a number of partners are also working with them to make sure that to the greatest extent possible, those regulations in their final form will work to avoid impacts. So that's some exciting new work that's being done by the state. I agree. I think it's also very careful. Um to avoid necessarily looking at these situations as an either or uh, conflict. Um, I think with, as the other panelists have said, with good planning and good focus, we can look at solutions that deal with all the interests and minimize the downsides. All right, well, thank you all. Um, so we have a hard stop at, <laughs> at 1051 because the next panel We'll, we'll, be, we, we'll be starting and we don't want to eat into their time. Um, so, so thank you all. Thanks, Jessica, Chess, Sam, and John. Um, um, some of the questions will be on the chat. And if you're interested in, in, in uh, taking a, a tackle at them, please feel free to do so. And thanks everybody for attending um, and participating in this uh, workshop, which is this uh, uh, panel, which has been you know, discussing something that's really important locally as well as globally. Um, so again, bye-bye everyone, and I'll um, uh, turn it over to, to, to Julie. Thank you, Shahid, to Jessica, to John, to Sam. We really appreciate that. That was a great conversation. Um, as a reminder, for those of you who join late, we are taping this and it will be posted on our YouTube page later. Um, turning to our second panel, uh, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Walters of the New York Farm Bureau, who's going to moderate our next panel. Uh, Walters is Deputy Director of Public Policy at the New York Farm Bureau, the state's largest general agricultural organization. Elizabeth served on the Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel to the state's Climate Action Council and at the Farm Bureau. Her areas of concentration include environmental and energy issues. I have worked with her for many years and we're very pleased to join that she's joining us here today. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Julie. and Thank you to the League for having me here today. Um, obviously, we have a great panel here. Um, uh, farmers, you know, really are on the front line of climate change, uh, whether extremes uh, have delayed planting, damaged crops, impacted yields and quality. Um, and I'm not just referring to those storms that we all think about with Irene and Lee and Sandy, but it's really everyday weather changes that we really have seen an increase in frequency. Uh, just this past year, uh, we have seen drought conditions, we have seen flood conditions, we have seen, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw a record 24-hour snowfall, which has 
damaged um, uh, greenhouses, brought down roofs on greenhouses, barns, and other agricultural buildings. So agriculture also has a role in impacting our climate, and we know this. Um, all industries, we all have an impact on our climate, and it's really important that we, we recognize that. Um, I think the largest two impacts that agriculture have in, in terms of climate change are really the methane and nitrous uh, oxide uh, emissions. Uh, they're two very powerful greenhouse gases, and you know we we know this uh, work has been uh, going on over the last uh, probably ten years in ways that we can can uh, mitigate those those impacts. So. Um, you, the one thing that I will say about agriculture and kind of the cool thing is that we're one of the few industries that really have the ability to sequester carbon and have a beneficial impact in that way um, on our climate. We also can be host, uh, you know, as was discussed in the last panel of, of renewable energy technology, uh, as well as landowners. So, um, you know, our panelists today are going to talk about, you know, all this potential that agriculture has um, in mitigating their own impacts, uh, but also um, you know, sequestering carbon uh, for, for all of us. Um, most of the practices that we're going to discuss today um, are already being adopted to a, a varying degree on farms. Um, it's not necessarily uh, for climate change uh, practices, but uh, they have kind of co-benefits, uh, whether it be water quality, erosion control, uh, and the like. Um, so. I think we're going to start off today um, kind of giving a broader overview of greenhouse gas mitigation potential on farms, uh, what opportunities are there for farms and working lands, um, talk about how agriculture is unique, um, and special considerations uh, that agriculture was afforded uh, through the CLCPA, um, and then we will talk about uh, carbon sequestration on farm, and then go into um, methane uh, destruct destruction through the use of anaerobic digesters. So I am happy to introduce our first panel panelists. Uh, Jennifer Whiteman is uh, from the Cornell College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. She's a research specialist working on greenhouse gas mitigation strategies at Cornell, and she's been doing this since 2002. Recently um, and currently, she's working on a project for New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation on greenhouse gas inventory, mitigation, and future scenarios for agriculture. So I'm pleased to introduce Jennifer. Welcome. Sorry, I was muted. Next slide. Okay, miraculously, I'm gonna do this in eight minutes. And this is the outline. Quickly, the CLCPA goals, the uh, farm greenhouse gases in context, the importance of evaluating all of these three greenhouse gases simultaneously, the New York State mandated, mandated global warming potential and why that's important. Um, five conceptual ways for farms to mitigate greenhouse gases. I'm probably gonna skip our smart decision make matrix for how we arrived at the top five mitigation opportunities in ag, um, because I wanna focus on the CLCPA and some of the weird things that are in the CLCPA. I think they're beautiful in a certain way, but they're also different. And if there's time, which I doubt, uh, I'll briefly talk about accounting because fundamentally these are accounting problems that we are dealing with. Next slide, and I think it's two forward. We all know the goals, 40% by 2030 and 85% by 2050. Next slide. <clears throat> but what I wanna point out here is that the majority of the problem in this state is not from agriculture. Agriculture is only 4%, so focus on the green bar and the green slice of pie. And why I think this is really important to stress is that our problem is keeping fossil fuel in the ground. Fossil fuel is ancient farming, buried, it is the ultimate carbon sequestration. And for every ton that we do not extract, we do not have to figure out some clever way of putting it back down. So 
Remember that while society at large is worried about CO2, it's a different story for agricultures. Next slide. In agriculture, we need to focus on carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. Next slide. And this is also for forestry, but um, we can go to the next slide. The reason why it's important to look at these three greenhouse gases, and if we focus on the right-hand side of this chart, is because methane is 25 times as potent or nitrous oxide is 298 times as potent of a greenhouse gas. And this is using the IPCC standards from the AR4 report on a 100-year time scale. Next slide. <clears throat> but New York State has chosen the IPCC AR5 standard of a 20-year timeline. And why this is important with respect to agriculture is you'll notice that methane is now 84 times as potent of a greenhouse gas than um, CO2. So using New York's accounting, we have, to, um, we have to recognize the elevated importance of mitigating methane and, and preventing methane. Next slide. And why this is important is because 75% of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions comes from methane and nitrous oxide and not, and not CO2. So remember, 80% of our emissions come from CO2, primarily from fossil fuel, but when we move to the agricultural sector, we have to sort of change our frame of reference to focusing on how to address the methane and nitrous oxide emissions. Next slide. So everybody refers to carbon sequestration and carbon sequestration is fantastic. And there's a million ways in which carbon sequestration is important, but this is actually the most important slide in my opinion of my whole talk is that there are so many other ways in which farms can participate in the objective of mitigating climate change. And so I prefer that people talk about farm greenhouse gas mitigation as opposed to just carbon sequestration because carbon sequestration is great. We can sequester it in trees like you heard in the last panel, in soils and importantly in long lived wood products, right? The tree grows for hundred years, it gets cut down, it goes into that door right behind me that's over 100 years old, right? That's 200 years of carbon sequestration. And as long as the house doesn't burn down, that is a serious long-term commitment. We can destroy methane. So we're producing methane on farm and there's many ways of capturing it and destroying it. We can increase our efficiency. So that means we reduce the energy use on farm. We increase the milk production efficiency. And what do I mean by that? If we can produce more milk with less feed, then we've required less acres and less energy inputs into those acres in order to feed those cows to produce that milk. And the same thing goes for crop production and notably nitrogen use efficiency. How we use nitrogen is very important because nitrogen, if you recall, is 300 times as potent of a greenhouse gas than CO2. So small changes in nitrogen have large impacts on the farm balance. Final, uh, the next one is displace fossil fuels. We could replace, um, we can burn the methane for energy, which you'll hear about later, but we can also create biomass either on the farms or forests. And we can displace energy intensive steel and concrete with wood products. And of course, conservation, it is the easiest thing to do and we very rarely prioritize it. It saves money, it saves energy, it saves natural resources and it leaves forests as forests. Next slide. This is kind of a reiteration of the last slide and what I want you to focus on, not so much as anything in particular, it's the gases that are important. So in a dairy system, feed management affects methane and nitrous oxide. Manure storage is methane and nitrous oxide. And I'm just trying to reinforce this idea that we have to think beyond carbon and we have to think about methane and nitrous oxide because we have terms like carbon sequestration and carbon farming, et cetera, and we need it to enlarge the ways in which agriculture helps us. Next slide. So next slide. How do we determine what is effective? So Peter Woodbury and I came up with a SMART matrix for looking at the co-benefits from any mitigation. How measurable of a quantity we can do at a New York state level. The cost to achieve that implementation, how realistic is it to implement, and the time frame of implementation. And there's a reference that you can look at to see more about this. Next slide. 
These were the 13 practices we evaluated in that report, but of course we're doing others beyond that. Next slide. These were our top five opportunities. Next slide. And I'm going to skip. Those opportunities were between zero and $50 per metric ton of CO2 mitigated. And I think that's a really important thing we always have to remember is the cost to implement any of these practices. Next slide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go forward a bunch of slides, Lisa, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, here, no, go back one. So one of the things that's unique about the CLCPA is that for the energy sector, it requires them to look at upstream factors of imported electricity and imported fossil fuels. Ag does not have to think about upstream nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen imported or imported food and feed and we import most of our food into the state. And so the implication here is basically a land use consideration. If the energy sector is looking to the ag land for solar or the forestry sector is looking to a forest, the ag land, right? We're losing that agricultural land. Um, um, and so there becomes this dynamic component of land use that we all really have to put our heads fiercely into on how we can get our food have our forests and get our energy. Um, and that's my timer, one more slide. So remember New York State chose the 20 year global warming potential. Remember that livestock has been exempted from legally enforceable. And all I mean to say about this is that what happens when a regulated sector moves into the ag sector such as waste, that emissions must be mitigated first. So we have to take care of the methane and the nitrous oxide first, and then the offsets get to get us to net zero. Um, and that offsets must be in the mandate, offsets must be real, additional, verifiable, enforceable, and permanent. These are very key words that I don't have time to talk about, and I'm gonna stop right there, but please pay attention to those words. And then at the very end, there, one, go back one, or go, these are some existing programs in New York State to help with farms, and I'll just end it right there. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we're going to have Samantha Levy from American Farm Land Trust. Samantha is the New York policy manager. Uh, she conducts research, builds coalitions around, and advocates directly for public policies and programs at all levels of the government that help keep land and farming, keep farmers on the land and help farmers adopt sound farming practices in New York. Samantha leads the Alliance for New York Farmland and a coalition advocating for farmland protection and farmland access for the next generation. Uh, and the New York Grown Food uh, no, New York Grown Food for New York Kids Coalition, a diverse member coalition advocating for farm to school programs. She also leads AFT Climate Work in New York, and she's a member of uh, the Agricultural and Forestry Advisory Panel to the uh, CAC. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you all about some of the ways that farmland is key to our fight against climate change. Um, Jenny gave a great overview, putting this um, discussion in context. Um, I'm going to start at a high level, then drill down and talk about the practices that we need farmers to adopt more of for climate and other reasons, and then cover the importance of farmland protection and finish with policies and programs to achieve these goals. And I'm going to attempt to do this in eight minutes, so buckle up. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to make a quick point that in New York, farming is a real economic driver, especially upstate. Farms contribute um, almost $50 billion to the state's economy and support a total of 160,000 jobs using nearly 7 million acres of farmland. About a quarter of the state's land is in farming. And a quarter of that is rented and that's important to keep in mind. Next slide, please. I'm gonna quickly orient ourselves to why we're talking about farmers and farm land in the context of climate change. Um, Elizabeth already went over some of this. Farmers are on the front line of climate change, feeling the impacts of extreme weather. And this is changing how we grow food and will continue to do so. Um, for our continued food security, we also need to produce 50% more food than we did in 2012 to feed a growing population by 2050. And those are FAO estimates. 
We also know, according to the IPCC, that we have to cut emissions as quickly as possible to stay below the two degree um, warming limit that would trigger catastrophic damage. And to do so, we can't just reduce emissions, but we also must sequester carbon already emitted into the atmosphere. And this is where forests and farmland um, can be uh, uh, play a key role. Next slide, please. And we need policies and programs to get us there. So as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm on the panel advising the Climate Action Council, as are many on this panel. Um, and agriculture needs to help us get to our net zero emissions goal by 2050. To do so on this panel, we've decided or determined that we need to double annual carbon sequestration on natural and working lands to 60 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2050 and reduce annual greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 30% by 2050. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the, the carbon sequestration side and flesh that out a little bit. Next slide, please. Part of the way to do this is to help farmers sequester more carbon in soils and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by following the four soil health principles that you see here on the screen. Uh, minimizing disturbance, maximizing soil cover, maximizing biodiversity, and maximizing continuous roots on farmland. Um, and AFT has been working with US Climate Alliance states like New York, providing technical assistance to help design policies to get us there. Um, and I'm gonna share some insider information with you today from that. Uh, next slide, please. This is not insider information. This is from a paper published in Science Advances in 2018. Um, and this graphic shows the carbon sequestration potential from 21 uh, management activities on natural and working lands that was detailed in this paper. The paper revealed that natural and working lands can sequester 21% of national greenhouse gas emissions if pro properly managed. So if you look, um, really attune your eyes to looking at the tiny type on the screen, you see that forest, forests really do um, uh, have a lot of the carbon sequestration potential, but our agricultural management practices have some of the potential there too. And they also represent some of the least cost near-term opportunities to start mitigating climate change. Also about 20% of the state's farmland is wooded. So um, any improvement in forest management activities does have implications for our farmland. Next slide, please. So talking about regenerative farming practices, um, it's important to keep in mind the potential of soils. Soils store two to three times more carbon than the atmosphere and two to five times more carbon than plants. And how we manage um, our farms matters in terms of how much um, soil organic matter there is and how much carbon they can potentially store. With these practices, there are also countless co-benefits, including resilience to extreme weather events, which is critical, as, as Elizabeth was saying, increased biodiversity, increased wildlife habitat, cleaner water and air, improved soil health, and improved farm viability. So they're all directionally um, moving us in the right direction. Next slide, please. So Elizabeth said, farmers are already doing a lot. That is true. Um, so we're gonna go over a little bit of that and talk a little bit about what they could do more of. Next, uh, if you could hit the next button. So um, first talking about cover crops, which were in those 21 management practices. This is um, keeping uh, soil cover, continuous soil cover and active roots. Cover crops were planted on over 200, almost 300,000 acres um, in New York, a 37% increase from 2012. And this is data that comes from the 2017 census. And they're sequestering 35,000 to 66,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year in soils, but only planted on 12% of available acres. There's potential to sequester up to an additional 267,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And if you hit the next button, we'll look at no-till and reduced tillage. So according to the census, 1.1 million acres reported reduced tillage and no-till out of 1.9 million possible acres. No-till also showed an increase of 21% from 2012. So we're moving in the right direction, doing good things. And this has uh, potentially reduced 20, 223,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. But converting all intensive and reduced tillage acres to no-till could sequester almost 600,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So between just these two practices, if we were to increase their adoption, we could sequester uh, over 1 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, and if you can move to the next slide, please. This um, is from a, a report and tool that AFT has developed for US Climate Alliance states called CARPE, Carbon Reduction Potential Evaluation Tool. And um, here you see a suite of, of management practices and their um, 
their greenhouse gas emission reduction potential. So this takes into account nitrous oxide and carbon um, dioxide emissions and sequestration and shows you the, rel the relative potential if we had 100% adoption on farms in New York State. And this shows you also um, what the practices are. Now, it's important to keep in mind that once a practice is implemented, it needs to remain in place to realize its full potential. Next slide, please. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the importance of protecting farmland to meet our climate goals. Next slide, please. This um, map comes from our Farms Under Threat State of the States report, um, which can be found online. Um, and if you hit, yes, thank you. Uh, so what we learned from this report was that between 2001 and 2016, New York lost a quarter of a million acres of farmland. We also learned that 54% of the state's land is nationally significant. Um, our finite irreplaceable best land for growing food over time and sequestering carbon with little environmental impact. Um, and we've only permanently protected 76,000 acres of farmland in New York State. You can see in the dark green on this map, this is where we've protected land. And the, the lighter green is where we have nationally significant farmland as of yet unprotected. Less than 1% of our farmland has been permanently protected. Next slide, please. Um, but permanent farmland protection is important because it retains those carbon sequestration gains in the soil with continued good management, but can further reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I know you talked a little bit about cluster development, smart growth in the last panel. Um, California uses farmland protection to implement smart growth, and they have invested in farmland protection projects that they've modeled will avoid 55 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent from vehicle miles traveled over the course of the next 30 years. So they're coupling farmland protection with planning to create urban growth boundaries. And that's something that we can look to uh, in New York State. Next slide, please. So um, one other quick thing to mention is that our farmers are aging and uh, to keep land and farming, we must help transition um, farmland to the next generation. We've got about 2 million acres that's transitioning over the course of the next several years. Um, and we need to be working to bring a new generation of farmers onto the land. Next slide, please. So finally, I'm just gonna touch on a few of the programs, policies, and solutions. Next slide, please. Again, I'm highlighting only a few here and yeah, you can keep clicking through, um, but to help, oh, okay, yes. Uh, programs to protect farmland and help farmers adopt climate smart farming practices are included in our state budget through the Environmental Protection Fund. We've got support for an incredible technical assistance network through conservation districts, extension, private advisors and nonprofits. We've got water quality programs that have brought us some of those gains and cover crops um, and no-till, uh, and these are some of them. Um, we've got a Cornell Soil Health Institute that's coordinating some of this work. And Resilient Farming Grants Program, which Jenny mentioned, the Farmland Protection Program, and then Farmland for New Generation New York, which is helping to facilitate that transition to a new generation. You can hit the next and then one more time. Um, there's also research going on. We need to improve our measure measurement and verification of carbon sequestered on farmland. We've got a number of research projects doing so and to address the barriers to adoption of practices. And if you hit the next slide, and of course the panel is working to prepare a scoping plan and go, you can go forward. And then there's some new and innovative policy and funding ideas. Um, and you can just click right through. These are just some of the ideas and some of the champions for those ideas that are under discussion and consideration. And then if you hit the next as well for farmland protection, um, there are some things we can do. And I know Jessica mentioned to look on your ballot for the kinds of things that you can support that, that um, put funding towards preservation like Community Preservation Act. Um, funds and Restore Mother Nature Bond Act. And then the next slide is just a final uh, word. Um, we have to consider helping farmers adopt practices long-term and on rented farmland where the incentives are different for them. We have to consider food security as we're planning um, when we're looking at protecting farmland and helping farmers adopt practices. And then I know that this came up in the questions and in the other panel, renewable energy siting. Of course, we need to consider how we can site solar smartly on farmland and forest land so that we can hit all of the goals. And I can talk about that more in the Q&A. Thank you so much for having me um, to present. And this is my email if you have further questions. Thank you, Samantha. Okay, next we're going to hear from John McCulley from McCulley Farms. Together with his father and his brother, John operates his family's about 1,100 acre beef and crop farm in North Northwestern New York. Um, the farm is a no-till no farm. 
and John will discuss his farming practices that he has implemented to help sequester carbon, improve soil efficiency, and replenish natural nutrients. John? Hi there. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of uh, how we got to where we are now. Um, in 1936, my great grandfather started our farm. Um, he did a lot of tillage, just like everybody else around him. Um, at the time, he really didn't know that he was destroying like soil structure, soil life, and releasing carbon out into the atmosphere. So that's like 72 years of soil destruction that we're just trying to start fixing now. Um, so in 2009, with uh, help from NRCS, um, with the thought of just saving time and money um, on our farm, we started a soil reconstruction plan with some experimental no-till. Um, we were surprised on how well it did. Um, we were saving trips across our fields and conserving tractor use, lowering our emissions. So in 2014, we made the decision to go 100% no-till and start to incorporate cover crops. Um, at this time, we've implemented the following cover crop rotation with an effort to return key nutrients back into the soil naturally. After wheat harvest, we're using 11 weight cover crop mix of Austrian winter peas, hairy vetch, crimson clover, sun hemp to attract beneficial pollinators, supply nitrogen for the next year's cash crop, rashes, purple top turnips to help loosen the soil and break up compaction, buckwheat to scavenge um, phosphorus from the soil and loosen up the top layer, sunflowers to help supply zinc, pearl millet to scavenge nitrogen, cereal rye to take up nutrients and release during the growing season. And we also use oats as a companion crop. Um, I like to think of this mix as we're going out into the forest and you see a, a wide variety of different trees, brushes, and plants. If one of my cover crops doesn't work, I still have 10 other species that will take its place and succeed where that one failed. Um, they help suppress weeds and help prevent erosion. Um, after corn and soybean harvest, we either no-till uh, cash crop of winter wheat, or we try to get a cover crop of cereal rye to keep something growing 365 days of the year. Um, in the spring, we will either plant green into these mixes, which means not killing the cover crop till after we plant. Um, planting green helps the planter get into the ground a lot easier, um, creates less hair pinning, um, gives the slug something to eat, which in fact it works as a natural um, deterrent as the cash crop emerges. Um, we've also directly no-till planted corn into the standing alfalfa and had really good luck at that. Um, we also plant that green also. Um, another practice we're doing is uh, cover crop rolling, which you can see in that center picture there. Um, and what that is is a chevron pattern roller crimper, which uh, goes across the field there and as it's laying the cover crop down, it's crimping it, which in turn, that helps terminate your cover crop ahead of the planter. And um, this gives the soil a blanket of protection from extreme rainfall events, um, keeps the hot sun off the middle of the rows till shading occurs, um, helps keep moisture in the soil, keeps nutrients where they belong, suppresses weeds. And by fall, the cover crop is all rotted down and becomes a nice layer of mulch for the next year's um, crop. Um, for an example, uh, during a rainstorm event, I went out into one of my fields and uh, seeing as the water was, uh, some of it was sinking in there, but also some of it was running off. But next to the road ditch there, I uh, put my hand down there and it was just as clear as anything. The water like was, uh, the cover crops were damming up and the water was just going in and out of the cover crop. Um, creating like little uh, channels there, but it was slowing it down enough where I was keeping my soil in place and keeping my nutrients where they belong. Um, being a no-till farmer, these cover crops are help keeping the combine up in the fall without causing ruts, warming the soil in the spring, helping produce more earthworms and other beneficial insects, and 
also helps with cluster carbon. Um, some of the practices that we're working on now as part of our regenerative agricultural plans are playing untreated seed because seed treatments were destroying beneficial insects and fungi within the soil. Only using pesticides when extremely necessary, getting 100% cover crops, planting on every acre, that's our goal. Um, trying to be more cognizant and then totally relying on synthetic fertilizers. Concentrate more on the cover crops. Um, we haven't really figured out that right ratio yet, but we're still working on that. Um, these practices have helped everything start working in synergy with nature. Um, another thing that we we're trying to do is control traffic. Um, where every piece of equipment drives on the same set of tracks in the field. And this is going to help prevent compaction. Um, in 2018, we had the opportunity to do a soil health case study with the American Farmland Trust. Um, in doing the study, we found that even though we had an increased investment in our equipment and attachments, um, we had a fuel, we had a savings on fuel and extra trips over the field, which all equated into an annual change in our net income of $25,000 or $44 per acre, which broke down into a 135% return on investment. So it looks like we we're on the right track. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was very good information. So next we're gonna to turn to Matt Tomek from uh, Energy Vision. Uh, Matt is the president of Energy Vision, a national environmental NGO, working to advance commercial and cost-effective options for a carbon neutral economy through research, outreach, and strategic advisory. Uh, since joining uh, Energy Vision in 2012, Matt's focus has been on the advancement of sustainable solutions for difficult to decarbonize uh, segments of the economy. Much of his work has uh, looked at the production and use of renewable natural gas made from urban and rural organic waste streams. Thank you, Matt, for joining us today. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the League for the opportunity to participate. Um, <clears throat> I think while we're all drinking out of the fire hose, I'll, I'll continue with the trend, but make a slight diversion from agriculture and, and come back to it at the end in, in hopes of teeing up uh, Chris Noble, who will finish out the panel and can talk to some of the specific activities that are happening uh, on his farm in, in New York State. Next slide, please. So Jennifer did a great job of, of laying this out. And, and I think the only point here is that methane in New York State represents about 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, using the, the global warming potential of, of 25 or, or, or 28 as referenced here, but, but 25 should be the number. And if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see that using the 20 year time frame. Uh, you know, the, the methane impacts are actually quite greater and as recognized by the CLCPA rightly, and, and this really aligns nicely with the climate science that recognizes we, we only have about a decade plus to, to make significant gains in, in reducing not only CO2, but, but especially these super pollutants like methane and NOx. Um, which are far greater, but, but don't last in the atmosphere as long. So methane only has a 12 year half-life in the atmosphere, but during that period, it's, it's far more potent in trapping heat. So next slide. So really what we're talking about here is, is you may have seen on the pie chart, the methane emissions that are coming out of New York, about 70% of those emissions are actually coming from waste related activities. Landfills being by far the largest source, uh, followed by wastewater. And then lastly, manure management and, and agricultural activities. And that 70% of methane coming from decomposing waste is really coming from a natural process known as anaerobic digestion. And through that process, which occurs in our stomachs and can occur in landfills or in, in dedicated systems, um, they generate biogas. Biogas is about 50 to 65% methane, depending on the source. Uh, 
And then that biogas can be utilized for a number of different purposes. Next slide. As I alluded to, today the vast majority of food waste and a good portion of the yard waste in, in New York and across the country ends up in landfills. Large quantities of biogas are produced. These landfills are required to capture that gas and destroy it. But even so, these landfills continue to emit uh, large quantities of biogas and, and methane, even, even when uh, these systems are in place. Next slide. Similarly, most medium and, and large wastewater facilities like Newtown Creek, shown here in Brooklyn, already have purpose-built digesters, which function similar to the way landfills do, but in a matter of weeks rather than years, they're able to process and break down organic material to produce biogas. Uh, they're much more efficient, and, and as I said, quick, and they, they come with a lot less leakage um, throughout the system compared to landfills. Next slide, please. And then in the agricultural realm, including here in New York State, dairy farmers have long recognized the opportunity to use digestion to better manage manure and nutrients, uh, including this farm in Homer, New York. Next slide. So to be clear, the digestion process is as old as time. In ancient times, biogas made from digestion was used primarily for, for cooking or, or to create heat. In more recent history, it has been used primarily to generate heat and power, as shown in, in these uh, CHP systems. Next slide, please. But we've seen a major shift over the past five years toward the cleanup or upgrading of this methane-rich biogas to <clears throat> pipeline or vehicle quality, at which point is known as renewable natural gas, RNG, or biomethane, as they call it in Europe. And essentially, by removing the moisture and impurities, uh, you're left with a nearly pure, clean stream of methane that's pretty versatile in its end uses. Next slide. So with RNG, there are a number of end use opportunities to directly displace fossil fuel demand, whether that be natural gas displacement uh, as a feedstock to produce things like uh, bioplastics or green hydrogen, or to dis displace diesel in medium and heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. And today, really the vast majority of RNG production in the country is going to the vehicle market. That's where the incentives are greatest. And one local example, New York's MTA began fueling uh, more than 700 of its buses on renewable natural gas last fall. And doing so allows the agency to save money and reduce greenhouse gas gases by about 40,000 tons per year. Next slide. So this trend toward using RNG and transportation is being driven largely by federal and state level policy and the incentives associated with that create uh, favorable economics to capture this methane and put it to use. Next slide. And really these incentives and, and policies are directly aligned with the climate science that looks at the life cycle carbon impacts of all different transportation fuels. At the far right of this chart, you'll see renewable natural gas produced from dairy manure in, in uh, California is the lowest carbon transportation fuel available. Uh, and it's actually a highly net carbon negative fuel because the amount of methane being captured is, is greater than the, the total emissions emitted throughout the entire process. Next slide. For a bit of context before coming back to New York, we've been tracking RNG projects around the country for the last five years. Uh, the number has grown significantly. There are about 160 projects now operating with another 150 under development, including many at agricultural operations, uh, especially dairy farms. Next slide. And in New York, there are currently two operational renewable natural gas projects, both at landfills, and both send their gas to California, where the credits and, and the economics are more favorable. There are, as you can see by the yellow pins, uh, a number of dairy projects, as well as the Newtown Creek Wastewater Project under development, 
Uh, and not surprisingly, all of these are also planning to send their gas to California where the market is more favorable. Next slide. And this sort of ties it all back together in terms of the fact that New York State has significant organics resource. Unfortunately, it's, it's largely untapped, uh, but we do have systems in place, infrastructure in place. We do have a 2022 landfill diversion mandate that's coming down, down the pike. And th there's an immediate opportunity to put these waste streams to, to use to capture the methane that's already being emitted by them uh, and, and to use that methane to displace existing fossil fuel demand, particularly in places like transportation or in the industrial sector, which, which are gonna be difficult to decarbonize. And I would just add that despite the fact that nearly every jurisdiction in the world has concluded that recycling organics via anaerobic digestion is in fact renewable and a sustainable solution in New York under the CLCPA, there remain questions about the eligibility of the strategy and the technology, uh, which is challenging and, and a bit unfortunate. But on the brighter side, we are working closely with Cornell through Pro Dairy, with Stony Brook University, uh, with Sustainable Dairy Technologies and others to assess the, the broader market potential uh, and opportunities to take advantage of this resource uh, in a way that makes economic, environmental, climate, um, and overall sense. So with that, um, I will go to, to the last slide and turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yes, next we have Chris Noble from Noble Purse Farm. Chris is a Senate generation farmer uh, which is lo located in the Western Ridge of beautiful Genesee uh, Valley in uh, upstate New York. Uh, Noble Purse Farms grows corn, alfalfa, trinical, and nearly 3,000 acres of farmland and cares for nearly 1,700 uh, dairy cows whose milk is converted to local and high quality dairy products. Chris is actively involved with Noble Hearst on-farm anaerobic digester that utilizes manure and food waste to create electricity and natural upcycling, a food waste collection business that directs excess food waste to anaerobic digesters and composting sites across New York and in the new Northeast, excuse me. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, that was quite a mouthful, but but I think it really kind of tees up, um, you know, a bit of what we're going to talk about here today. And thanks for Matt for the introduction. Um, so I think, you know, to start, I want to talk a little bit about our farm and, and sort of Going back to John's comments about um, no-till, you know, our farm has been continuously farming um, this land for about 200 years, and um, really have been focusing on, you know, the, what's the next iteration of of sustainability for our business. I mean, obviously, longevity is sustainability, but but also improving, um, you know, the the resources that we have. Um, our goal isn't necessarily to be the biggest farm, but I think you know we're we're focused on becoming a more sustainable farm. So I think there's um, you know, lots of opportunities there, both, both on the dairy side as well as, as the farmland. Um, we're really driven by the principles of, of people, planet, and profit. So I mean, all, all three of those principles need to work together seamlessly to, to create that sustainable focus. Um, so this picture itself uh, sort of looks at you know, the campus that I guess Noblehurst Farms resides on. So in, in the foreground is, is a dairy farm, which has been uh, on that location since 1960. Um, on, the, on the far part of the uh, slide is, is Craig Station Creamery, which is a milk processing business that uh, we have in partnership with other farms and our cooperative. And then in the middle, you can kind of make out this little circular structure is our anaerobic digester. And that's, that's a, a vessel that we uh, invested in, in in 2014, along with NYSERDA, um, received some funding from a program, uh, Pond 8624, uh, 2684, uh, back in that time. Um, and the idea was to convert uh, manure as well as uh, food waste from the local community into biogas. And that biogas would then um, be converted into electricity that would then power the rest of the campus. And so, you know, being, you know, that being the, the overall model, you know, I think we, you know, thanks for the, the slide, 
um, we sort of looked at how how do we, we best represent you know our, our goals of not only sustainability but but lowering our electricity costs and and providing an outlet for food waste in our community. And so um, you know this vessel is actually a 1.3 million gallon um, uh, sort of concrete structure that. That then incorporates the dairy dairy cow manure from the farm and then the food waste that comes in from the local community so um, it really when, when it comes down to it we're we're taking organic material that has been um, you know either land applied or or not um, you know, you know, brought into a, a closed system and put it into a vessel that can that can discreetly and quickly uh, turn that into biogas and so this is kind of our our process on a single screen that again represents the manure and the, and the food waste uh, that, that comes into the structure. It resides for about 28 to 35 days within the digester, creates biogas, and then that biogas is then run through a, a combined heat and power system um, that converts it into electricity as well as heat. The electricity is um, sold back to National Grid and we actually net meter that power, so we we sell or buy any any power that we need on the farm and in the campus uh, through that relationship with the grid. Um, we're now investing in a second um, CHP system to uh, convert even more of the biogas into electricity to, to get to the point where we're about 800 kilowatts or uh, roughly six million kilowatt hours a year of electricity produced. And this um, digester power, I think, is similar to. Um, you know, sort of hydropower and that it's a 24 seven reliable source of energy um, and, and also provides the, the greatest offset to our farm in terms of energy consumption, which is electricity. Um, talking a little bit more about the food waste side and, and Matt talked about the, the 2022 landfill diversion mandate that New York State has, has set up as well as um, been advocated by the league and others. Um, so that is a, a program to divert um, two tons, and so large scale generators of food waste that create more than two tons per week of food waste must divert from landfills into either compost or digester operations like ours on, on, uh, in, in Western, Western New York. And I think that's, um, that's, a, that's a good start to the, to the process. And I think you know, that there is a beneficial reuse for this material, both in terms of energy production, as well as um, returning those nutrients back onto the land where they belong. You know, so that nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium that ordinarily would go into a landfill and, and be very uh, hard to recover, uh, now goes back into to land and, and, and be sequestered in a way that's, um, that's, that's long-term. So, um, so I do wanna talk a little bit about the, the long-term, the roadmap. I think you know, that's a good start for our food waste diversion in New York State. Um, but I think long term, we'd need to look at all different different types of um, you know, infrastructure to recycle the food waste and also create as much carbon sequestration as we can, uh, whether it be through composting or digestion, uh, to get to that point. And I think you know, this type of system is, is replicable. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, it could be replicable in, in other parts of the states, but it's, it's, not a, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution. So I think a lot of innovation that needs to, to go on to, to get to our eventual goal of returning that methane and returning that carbon back to the soil where it belongs. So I think I'll stop there and maybe we can um, go to the Q&A. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think we'll go back um, and talk a little bit about uh, regenerative farming practices and um, uh, carbon sequestration. There's a question about what programs are available at the state level. I'll throw in the national level too, because um, I know there are some funding programs there. Um, but if, if you guys wouldn't mind answering the question, and what types of programs, particularly John, if you guys have taken advantage of any existing programs out there um, and uh, go from there. Um, so I've, uh, I've worked a lot with NRCS and um... I've done the no-till program with them. That's what really got us started in this. And then uh, we went on from there and got into the cover crop program. Um, and then we've done the conservation, uh, CSP, Conservation Stewardship Management Program also with them. And uh, they're just really a good group of people to work with. Great. 
can you talk a little bit more? Um, we had a number of questions about profitability, use of pesticides, herbicides, how you've seen that change on your farms. Um, and, and what is the barrier and why do you think maybe your neighbor down the road hasn't converted to these practices? So I guess when we, uh, we got into this, I mean, we were a little hesitant to get into it. Um, there was a couple farms that were next to us that were um, a little bit larger scale than us. Um, their biggest problem is one year they went out and they planted all their uh, crops no-till. Sluts came in there and just demolished everything they had. So we went and um, we were a little concerned about that when we got into it. But as we started to do more with the cover crops, you know, giving the slugs something to eat and get them away from the cash crop, it's really helped out. Um, the only time I'll really use pesticides, I mean, I have to have right at the top level of pests out there. Because the worst part about using them is if you go out there and spray them, you're going to kill off all the beneficials out there besides just killing that one certain pest. And I'm not... I really don't want to lose that beneficials out there because they're doing more good for me than anything. So like, um, like I'll go out there and I'll pull a leaf off. And if I got soybean aphids, I'll, you know, actually look on the leaf and if the leaf is covered in it, yeah, that's going to hurt my cash crop. So I guess I'm going to go out there and apply it. But if I got a bunch of ladybugs flying around there and I don't have, there isn't very many uh, soybean aphids on the plant. Well, I'm not going to go out there and spray it. I'm just going to let those, Ladybugs take care of those aphids for me. Um, the profitability, I mean, I have not went down in profit since I've switched doing this. I've really, we've really went up in profit because we're saving on the trips across the field. Um, the cover crops, I mean, yeah, they're costing me probably about anywhere from, I don't know, $10 to uh, probably $30 an acre. But I'm looking more towards that benefit of long-term goals. And I'm really figuring that in my, um, when I do my worksheet at the end of the year there for profitability of the farm and what I need to sell my crop at. And all this is starting to plug in and I'm able to make, you know, the same amount of money I did on conventional doing all the tillage and stuff that I am with the no-till. Um, I've had a lot of, uh, there's been, there's, now it's starting to take, we sort of got, um, me and a couple other guys there, we've uh, sort of made this, uh, I don't know, group there where we call each other and we can discuss, you know, like last year it was so wet out there. I was looking at my fields and I went out and, you know, with the cover crops there, I'm like, man, I don't know if I should go out there and, you know, plant yet. It's really wet out there. I called up my friend over in uh, Avon, New York, and I said, hey, I go, he's a no-tiller too. And I go, what do you see? And I go, are you able to go? And he goes, yeah, he goes, the cover crops there, they're keeping all the mud down. And he goes, we're going through there. We're not, nothing sticking to our planters. So I go, well, I guess I'm going to go out there and start planting corn. And I went out there and started planting corn. And, you know, it was one of my best years that I've ever had last year. Across the farm, we averaged 200 bushels the acre, which was a huge plus. This year, with that dry spell that we had, we were down about 172 bushel across the farm, which that's still a really good average for our farm. And um, I mean, soybeans, you know, we're averaging right around uh, 52 bushels the acre across the farm. That's including, you know, around the edges and stuff, which I'm happy with that number. Um, wheat, we're anywhere from 70 bushel up to uh, I think 82 bushel around the farm. So the yields really haven't fallen off. Um, in fact, they've sort of gotten a lot better but it's taken a lot of, with no-till, you got to really think about what you're going out there and actually doing. Like, it's not something that you can just go out there and fix with a disc and a plow and a, you know, you're getting all, you go out there and you look at it after I go out and no-till and I'm like, first couple of years, I'm like, man, this looks like, this is horrible looking out here. Who would want to ever do this? I have people that drive past my farm there that will stop and to talk to my dad there and be like, what, what is your son doing? This doesn't look good at all but they are not looking at the big picture of when I get back to getting in the combine to go in there and do my yields, everything's been good. Great, thank you. That's really important to know that you guys had had so much luck and stories like yours definitely 
Um, we found farmer to farmer conversation is the best way to get these practices moving. Um, so it's so great to have you here talking to a larger audience. Um, so I think I'm gonna switch gears over a little bit, kind of a carryover from the last discussion on um, uh, renewable energy siting on farms and some of the challenges that that pose. Um, so there's been a couple questions in the box about that. So I'm gonna kind of combine them and, and you know, can we talk a little bit about agrovoltaics? Can we talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the challenges, barriers, and what can be done in order to um, have them kind of peacefully coexist within the state with our, our laudable goals um, that, that the governor has, has set forth there? Sure. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. I, I suppose that's for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, smart, smart renewable energy siting. Of course, we, we particularly look at solar because wind is very compatible with um, continued farming, giving farmers the opportunity for those lease payments um, to contribute to farm viability while they keep farming and then also create renewable energy for the grid. So um, solar is where we see a little bit more of a conflict um, happening. So the way that we think about it at American Farmland Trust since we're looking at farmland quality and also farm viability is best case scenario, we'd really like to see policies put in place where um, we're being mindful of uh, avoiding our best farmland for growing food, um, for food security concerns, for farm viability concerns. This is where, um, you know, we if we keep farming on this really good land, then we're not pushing the farming to our marginal land where it's more environmentally sensitive and harder for farmers to make a viable living. Um, but we also wanna make sure that farmers have the opportunity to um, site solar on their farms in a way that helps them keep continue in farming, just like as I was describing with wind. So uh, a having a portion of the farm put in solar, um, being mindful to avoid our best soils, making sure developers are following Department of Ag and Markets guidance for best practices so that the land can stay um, viable for agriculture and, and uh, if solar is put there. You know, on the agrivoltaic side, um, you know, of course, there are other states and other countries that are far ahead of us when it comes to the potential. Um, I think in New York, we're seeing a lot of really great work with sheep grazing, um, coexisting with solar, um, but we don't really yet have the proof of concept in New York State to coexist crops and develop uh, solar on the same parcel. So I think there are opportunities for research there and potential government policies if we see real good proof of concept um, to make that available. Because as I was saying, we're seeing this transition of land. It's hard for new farmers to get access to land. This could be a way for new farmers to gain access to land. Um, and, and in Massachusetts with their incentive for agrivoltaics, we're seeing cases where developers are now in the farmland access game, they're looking for farm managers, um, but you really need to think through those policies well and they need to be based on good science. Maybe I'll just give you my two stunts on, on that. So um, there are a lot of, in Western New York, uh, solar developments going on, um, and it's mostly related to the availability of infrastructure. So large power lines, a lot of capacity. Um, on our farm, uh, you know, we, we elected to actually install some solar panels on uh, roof. So um, in uh, this year, we're actually going to be putting 750 kilowatts on the, the, the roof of the barn that you saw in that picture. And so that'll allow us to uh, have a, a further renewable energy footprint, but not be at a scale that requires significant investment in additional infrastructure or give up. A lot of what we have on our land is just prime farmland. We don't want to, you know, go away from that uh, and put solar panels on, even if the economic uh, value in the short term was uh, more beneficial to us. So that's just, you know, a little bit of our experience. Um, a lot of drivers there, though. Go ahead, Jenny. So I think there's an incredible opportunity to redirect this so-called conflict to the 1.7 million acres of idle land in our state, because there's several problems that are happening. We have the retiring folks. So if you're getting $1,000 an acre for solar and for the next 25 years, talk about a great retirement plan, right? So I understand the pressures that are making it go in this direction, but we also have to remember there's been a whole history of removing trees, removing rocks and building up soils on these lands. 
And that is a heritage of New York farmland that we need to really honor and respect. And I think even the point about agrivoltaics, like what if we looked at this idle and underutilized land for solar and agrivoltaics so that we diversify the economy? We don't shrink the agricultural land currently held by farmers. We actually expand it by reinvigorating this 1.7 million acres of idle and underutilized land. So there is no competition. And also, there is also not the lost jobs associated with the acres that have moved from biological production, say a corn crop, to a passive solar, meaning passive actors, not passive solar, um, solar arrays. And so I just think there's a wonderful opportunity here for us to think creatively and not think conflictually on this. I, that's my comment. 100% <laughs> great. Um, let's go back to digesters. Um, there's a question about concentrated uh, feeding operations um, and whether you know the state should move away from them. Um, Chris, I'm sure you have an opinion about that. Um, but also would like to talk about digesters, their benefit, um, and uh, you know the support structure needs that that exist here uh, in New York um, in terms of providing a framework like they have in California, if you could speak to uh, both Matt and Chris, the legislation that has been proposed um, and that you know a number of us have been supporting to help really support uh, digesters in, in uh, mitigating methane emissions. Sure, I'll let Chris handle the, <clears throat> the CAFO question. So you want me to start is what you're saying, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our, our farm is a CAFO uh, that is defined by uh, 300 animal units or, or higher on, on an individual farm. Um, you know, the, the, so digesters and CAFOs, uh, for the most part, um, are the only, uh, so digesters really uh, on farm setting um, coexist uh, very nicely with um, CAFOs. So having all the storage of the manure together in, in one efficient place allows there to be the, the critical mass of material to be able to invest in a digester. You know, there's certainly smaller scale systems that, that could be implemented, but um, you know, the, the, the scale matches nicely. It's also uh, more efficient um, on a per unit basis to, um, uh, you know, to, to harvest uh, that methane um, on, on the larger CAFO operations. So I think you know, it's a little bit of a balance there between having more of a smaller scale regenerative system with a larger scale system that um, you're able to um, you know utilize these technologies in a way that's more impactful uh, from a state CL CPA perspective. Yeah I mean <clears throat> I would just add that I mean, we've been tracking the, the dairy sector and, and agriculture broadly for a long time and you know far farmers particularly dairy farmers have have been plagued with <clears throat> with low milk prices for, for a long time. And our sense is they often like Chris and his family and, and John and his family want to be doing the best thing, the right thing for the climate, for, for their land and, and to conserve those resources. And digestion to us is, is a real opportunity to improve the on-farm economics while, while also creating you know, opportunities to prevent methane, to prevent runoff of manure into bodies of water. And so it's, it is a, a win-win as we see it. In terms of the policies, I mean, <clears throat> I hate to keep referring back to California, but I mean, California several years ago kind of recognized that methane is a short-lived climate pollutant that needs to be addressed and if it can be addressed quickly you can have outsized impacts and benefits to to the broader push not only state level but global push to address the climate crisis and by by doing so that they effectively set up i mean countless policies and programs to incentivize uh things like landfill diversion but also things like methane capture in the in the dairy sector in California and the California Department of Food and Agriculture and the Energy Commission have laid out 
hundreds of millions of dollars over the past five years to do just that. And so they've they've really put put their money where, where their mouth is effectively to to make this possible. Uh, and then on the back end, they, they they have, as I mentioned, the low carbon fuel standard, which creates a very lucrative market for things like RNG, but also things like electric vehicles and other biofuels. And so New York does have legislation that was introduced in 2019 by Assemblymember Werner to do just that, to, to introduce a low carbon fuel standard or a clean fuel standard, as we're now calling it. And such a program would do a lot to, to help you know, provide a market and create the certainty to make investments in this kind of infrastructure. So we've been supportive of that and continue to, to track those um, developments and, and hope that New York can, can recognize. And I see Jennifer's eager to chime in. Yeah, and, and Jennifer, if you could also talk about other programs, um, particularly the, the cap and flare program for, for those smaller farms. I know, uh, to my recollection, there is uh, one 350 cow dairy that has a digester that also takes on food waste, um, but it's, it's not as practicable for those smaller farms. So if you could talk a little bit about that with your additional point. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, you know, Digesters are not a one size fits all, clearly. And there are lots of different programs that Ag and Markets is actually actively working towards for alternative mechanisms for managing methane emissions from manure. So additionally, you know, if we choose to make methane, we are actually choosing to break down the carbon structure that is in the manure. That is actually a wonderful soil amendment, right? Again, not appropriate for all farms, but for example, in New York State's composting program, one of the ideas for the composting program is to cover up lead soils so that the composted food products is actually mitigating an urban project problem. So like, yes, we can go towards producing methane for uh, renewable natural gas. We can produce methane to produce electricity for an electric vehicle, which is the equivalent of kind of low carbon fuel standard. Or we could go to a more composting route and improve our soil carbon. So like, we just have to remember that every one of these decisions has different kinds of trade-offs and different applications for different size farms. So I'm not advocating the end of CAFOs, but I am advocating uh, appropriate solutions for different size farms and different environmental contexts. Very good, thank you. Well, we are up on our time. Um, so I will turn it over to Julie now. Great, thank you so much. We appreciate it. That was a great discussion. Um, thank you all for participating uh, in the panel today. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members uh, for being here this morning. We hope you learned a few new things about our vital natural resources and the role they play in addressing climate change. Um, I want to once again thank our partners, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School, our sponsor, Con Edison, to all of our panelists for, for both panels for this great discussion today. Um, as a reminder, if you tuned in late or you want to rewatch, this video will shortly be up posted on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash NYLCV. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is part of our series on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So stay tuned for more forums like this one coming up in the next couple of months. Follow us at, at NYLCV on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and obviously YouTube for updates. Um, and if you're not already signed up for our email list, please do so at www.nylcbef.org. Thank you all and have a great weekend. <laughs>